Good morning. I'm about to take this 92 Ford F-150 truck that I bought brand new on a road trip adventure. I haven't taken this truck out of town in many years. The reason I'm taking this truck today is my Dodge Cummins diesel truck is fully loaded for next weekend swap meet and I need room in this truck in case I find something along the way to pick up. I'm going up to visit a friend and he has an incredible collection of not only gas pumps but traffic signals and train signals. Stay tuned, there's lots to see in this video. Yeah, this F-50 has 231,000 miles on it right now and she still purrs like a kitten. The strangest thing happened, I planned this salvage yard tour and to visit a very good friend up north and the very day before somebody contacted me through, through YouTube that had a gas pump that was available on the way. Let's check it out. Oh, that's pretty cool. One doesn't have glass, this one doesn't have glass. Okay, here. it's got everything in it. Everything. That's what I like. And these, these are the aluminum faces. Yeah. It's an older model. Yeah, it's really old. The cable, we just had it there so no one steal it, but. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it looks good. Yeah, I'd like to buy it. How long have you had it? Uh, it came with the property that I was living on. Uh, it was there. It had been there on that property for about since since probably when it first came in production. Honestly, it had been sitting there. It was still installed in the ground. Okay. It's still attached to the ground tank. See the, the threading still freshly taking off? Yeah, I see that. So just the connection the, pipe the, underneath there. So that old gas flowing through it and everything. Great. Well, I'm excited. Yep. Thank you very much. Let's get her loaded up. All right. That's the hard part. This thing's heavy. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it weighs at least a couple hundred pounds. Yes. All right. We got her loaded up. Thing was quite heavy. And we're going to get back on the road. I am at my good friend Tom's house and there's a gas pump that I brought Tom that he's been after for many many years since he has seen it in my collection and he'll tell you the story once we get it unloaded. first got my driver's license when I was 16 years old our brother Doug and I used to go to the Saga swap meet and at the time highway 14 ended at San Fernando Road and you either got on Sierra Highway to go to Newhall I mean to uh, Lancaster or to get to the swap meet you got on old San Fernando Road in downtown Newhall this gas pump and a twin were at an old gas station and they weren't being used and I drive by it and I look at it all the time Doug and I'd make remarks and then uh, for the next 20 years that I lived out in Santa Clarita, I would drive by this and I'd look at that gas station and I'd think, boy, that pump would be really cool to get someday. Then one day it disappeared. So I'm over at Rob's house and I look and it's inside of one of his buildings there. And after that, I was like, oh, I got to see if Rob will ever sell that to me. So he did. And I found this pump on Craigslist one Saturday afternoon and I called the phone number and asked if it was still available and a woman answered and she said yes it's available and I said well I'll be right over and I hopped in my Ford F-150 that you see here that I've had since 1992 went down there and uh, she let me into the garage and this pump was sitting in the back of the garage and apparently 
her husband was a car collector and had this in his collection with his classic cars but he had passed away and she told me it was ready for it to find a new home so now it found another home yes <laughs> so now it ended up in tom now it's going into tom's collection and i'm thrilled that it's going to tom because he like i said had a story with it a history with it yeah. from way back when way from from 1970 i guess 1971 or something like that 1970 71 it's the first time i saw it that's great yeah very cool thank you rob you're welcome <laughs> What we have between these amazing gas pumps is a 1910 Wiley traffic signal light. Tom, can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, R.W. Wiley was a traffic engineer for the city of San Francisco. And being that San Francisco was a Victorian city, they went and they decided they'd make their traffic lights pretty fancy. So he came up with this birdcage design for it. And what's cool about this one is right now, this would be, as a signal, would be shut off because at nighttime they didn't run them and uh, they didn't want the bells clanking all night and uh, wearing out the mechanisms. So they'd shut them off and the traffic lights would actually go to sleep. And most cities had that feature on their traffic lights so they wouldn't wear out the uh, mechanisms <clears throat> and all the relays. So this would be how it's asleep and then in the morning it would come back to life again. <laughs> And the lenses at the bottom are what they call a wavelength light, which are lens, so the light can be seen from any angle. So if a car was coming down the street, it would be able to see it, and a car up close would be able to see it just as bright. That's amazing. And what's neat about it too is the stop and the go, those are porcelain on it. Made to last a lifetime. Yes. Many lifetimes, actually. So then at night time, we'd just go to sleep and the red light would be on all night long and it, and it became a stop sign instead of a traffic light. Incredible. Okay, the next one over here, that is a Darley traffic light. And what's neat about this one is, before they had standards for lenses, different traffic signal companies came up with their own design for lenses. So these are called orange peel lenses because they almost look like a almost like an old Christmas ornament type and it's a very vibrant color uh, an actual true green and red and what this one is set up to do you can hear it it's got a motor in the bottom of it and there's a little 110 volt motor running and this traffic light is also 100 years old and it moves contacts and they had no yellow light because nobody thought they needed a caution to slow down so what this one would do is when the traffic light was changing from red to green, it would light up both of them at the same time. And that was the caution that told you that the uh, light was gonna go to red. Interesting. And I've got it set on a lot faster cycle, of course, than it would be in, a, in an intersection because nobody wants to stare at it for three minutes waiting for it sure, to change color. Sure, sure, that makes sense. So we'll watch it there again and you'll see it, you'll see it up there. To go. It's all lit up now. Okay, I see that. That stage it goes through there, that's, that's neat, the warning stage. Right, like this one over here on the end is a, um, I forget what they call that, uh, a four-way traffic light. And what that one does, when it goes red, all both tops will stay red for a, a couple of seconds there before they clear and go to green. Okay. Just gives the intersection a, an extra second or two to get cars out of it. Sure, kind of like our orange or yellow light. Yes, and that... That signal was made by uh, Boyd Traffic Signal Company in Columbus, Ohio, and they didn't make very many of them because they made them too heavy duty and they were too expensive, so most cities went for the cheaper lights. Interesting, okay. And here we have a 1905 to about 1920 semaphore traffic signal. Can you tell me a little bit about this, Tom? Yeah, it was made by Acme Signal Company in Los Angeles, and the only thing that that company ever manufactured was uh, traffic lights. And uh, they were very complicated, they had a lot of parts that would wear on them, so the way they designed them was they'd shut off at night when there was no traffic. So at nighttime, this is what you'd see is that little light at the bottom flashing, and it would just flash red all night long, and then in the morning, about 6 a.m., they'd, they'd all come to life again so they wouldn't run all night and the bell ring and wake people up. So here it is, shut off, and then we'll just go through the cycle. Cool. 
It's a mechanical marvel. <laughs> it's amazing. Beautiful piece of machinery. Thank you, Tom. And what do we have here? This flashing stop sign. This has caught my attention also. Yeah, it's a personal stop sign with the, with the glass beads in it. And it had a bank of batteries inside it in the back that were locked in. It's uh, 1932 and it was made by a Facility Signal Company in Linwood. And they had these all over, or not all over, but they have a lot of these in Los Angeles too on the intersections. So it was built in Linwood, California. Yes. Wow, that's in beautiful condition. So the headlights would reflect off these marbles. Yes. Here we have a beautiful Bennett 646 Richfield pump. All original. I love it when they have these original decals, Tom, and add glass. And the inspection on the door there too, on the window. It was last used June 30th of 1962. Wayne 60 narrow body, all original Sky Chief silver paint. The glove too is an original. Is it really? Yeah, it's got a date on the glove too, it's a hull. Oh yeah, three of 39. Very nice. That's my traffic control selection there. Let me turn one of these on for you, Rob. You'll okay. Out of this. this is one of the first barricade flashers and it's Got a neon bulb inside there. I like the sound of Isn't it. Isn't that neat? That is neat. That flasher is probably a late 40s. Oh, that is so neat. You have quite a collection of these. Yeah, any of the metal body ones are, are uh, pretty old ones. Amazing. And then all the lanterns all have city names on them. Even some have railroad names on them too. Okay. How long have you been collecting these? Uh, ever since I was a kid. If I could find them in a swap meet for 50 cents back then, I'd buy them. <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. And I remember these, you light these. Yeah, the road torches. And a few of these are marked, that's like California Division of Highways. Uh, that orange one is Kern County Road Department. Okay. I like things that are, that are local to the area. Sure. Amazing. And you have barricade flashers down here, huh? And, and old barricades. Those, that barricade you're looking at right there, Rob? Yeah. Let me pull this away. That barricade is about 52 years old. Wow. People think that, you know, they look at these, they think they're modern and new, but the new ones are all plastic, they're taller. Yeah. And these were actually made silk screen. And what's cool about them is the white paint on them has crushed glass in them. So re car headlights will reflect, like, uh, I forget what they call it, schmaltz is what they call it okay. when it's on a sign. But I don't know if we can get it to light up or not, but if you can tell or not. Yeah, they, it's, I can see it's sort of reflective. Yeah, and like that one, the whole panel lights up. So when your car headlights hit it, you would see these at night. That is so neat. I, you know, I've not known anybody to collect <laughs> barricades like this. Yeah, they haven't used yellow barricades since, uh, I think about 1970. They changed everything over to uh, white and orange and took all these out of service. So to find them now, they would have to be sitting in some old construction company where they just didn't get thrown away. Okay, great. Okay, during World War II, the uh, Army had a need for a dozer that they could put inside a glider and uh, land it behind enemy lines to build airstrips. So they would load these in a, in a glider with the pilot and co-pilot, drop them out of the sky. They would find a place that, that, well, they didn't really have much choice. They would just land. And a lot of times it was a crash landing. 
Then they'd start this thing up and they start clearing uh, some land out and they'd drop uh, 15, 20, 30 of these at a time. Wow. And they'd build a landing strip and then they could bring in bigger planes and stuff and they could do inland invasions. Whereas at the time the enemy thought they'd be coming from the sea so they'd be uh, all tied in at the beaches. And instead they'd be coming in behind them at the same time as they were being invaded from the sea. So anyways, they called these the flying dozer. They call them uh, an airborne dozer is what it's really called. And uh, the short name for them is called an air dozer. So it was made for the army airborne and uh, they made them up until, well, the end of the war. And then they made a civilian version after that. But this is a, a truly a war made tractor and it's in excellent condition. They're very hard to find in the United States because most of them were sent over to Europe and they left them there to help with the rebuilding after the war. So they never returned them to the US. The ones that are, I believe, left in the country were ones that when the war was over, they still had them here in production. They finished them up and they sent them out to different military bases. Then later on, they'd surplus them out and contractors would buy them. So you can see the uh, around in different places, you can see the green paint showing underneath the yellow. So this one actually has had very little use on it and um, everything works. It's got the, uh, the blade on the front. Somebody built a ripper for the back of it. And it's also got a winch on the back too that I'll show you. Okay. And then Rob, it's got the tag on it here behind the blade. And then that says uh, Air Dozer and Army Airborne. I don't know if you can see that or not. It's got the serial numbers. And they were made by Clark Equipment Company. Uh, which uh, Clark is still in business and builds the Bobcats and uh, forklifts and things like that. Yes. So does it run? Yes, it's, it runs really well. It's got a four-cylinder Waukesha in it. Okay. Originally they were, I believe they were six volt and then they were converted to 12. Uh, these boxes on the side didn't have lids on them when the military had them. And what they did is they would fill these boxes with rocks. Okay. And it would put extra weight on the dozer so that it could get through the jungle and clear stuff out. So literally you had to have two box, uh, box of rocks on it to hold it down. Oh, that's neat. And then these sides here are hinged to dump the rock. They would just dump that down this way. Oh, wow. So anyways, this one's been converted and, and I just keep uh, different parts and tools in yeah, this side. Yeah, your grease guns in there. And the battery in the other side. Let's take a look at the rear end here. Yep, there's the winch. It's got one cylinder that leaks, so I'm gonna rebuild that. Okay. For the uh, ripper. It's quite a winch. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Yeah, they use these to, to pull planes around and, and uh, things that were crashed and stuff like that to clear up if they got bombed or something. Yeah. It's a very wow. versatile machine. Very historical. Very historic, yes. Because most of them didn't, didn't uh, end up back in the U.S. Well, let's hear it run, Tom. Okay. Just turn the ignition on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. I'm, I'm just so shocked at how well this thing runs. It sounds healthy, yeah. very healthy. And it just fired right up. And cold start, cold start. Yep. Yeah. Wow, that is exciting. And the nice thing, I don't have to shut the fuel off on it. The, the carburetor doesn't stick and the bowl is, you know, nothing. It's just boom, it's ready to go every time you look at it. Tom, thank you very much for opening your home up to me, inviting me to see your collection and to share it with all my YouTube viewers. 
for anyone watching this video, I want to say thanks for watching it. I hope you like this content. I try to do a mix of automotive related or petrol content. And stay tuned because I have much more content coming soon. Thank you.